Well, welcome everybody. Uh, glad to have you back with us. Um, this is again is our light, our life school class, our forerunner school uh, class called "Becoming an Eternal Purpose House of Prayer," or "Building an Eternal Purpose House of Prayer." This is session nine, uh, so we're coming close to an end uh, of it. We have this session and one more. It'll be ten sessions in all in our class. This session, session nine, is called Growing in Effectiveness and Authority. Growing in Effectiveness and Authority. Um, so we want to deal, actually, in this session with some of the uh, character or the lifestyle issues that will help us to increase our effectiveness and uh, not only effectiveness, effectiveness, but also of authority as we pray eternal purpose prayers. And I've started the session in the notes and uh, hopefully you'll, you have the notes and we'll read the notes because uh, I'm not sure that I'll be able to cover everything in as much detail as we do have in the notes. Uh, but the, 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 I've headed this first section called More Than Words. And I think that really sums up uh, a lot of the uh, of this, the purpose of this class, of this session, is that there's more than words involved in being effective and having authority in an eternal purpose house of prayer. In fact, even the title of the session really uh, describes a lot of what uh, we want to talk about in this session, growing in effectiveness and authority. Uh, that it's, So really three points here. We can be, a f first one is that we can be uh, effective, uh, we can, and we can have authority in our prayers. We can do that as we pray these things. You know, sometimes when you think about praying into God's eternal purpose, the, 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 the subject matter is so vast and so uh, powerful and so global or, or eternal or, or heavenly beyond uh, anything that we could ever think or imagine that we could have an impact on. Uh, the bride being made ready around the earth, for example, then it becomes uh, almost to the point that we wonder if we can even really make an effect, make an impact or be effective. And, and, and can we really have authority in those kind of prayers? We start thinking about restraining the spirit of Antichrist or um, resisting the great harlot and the queen of heaven, those kind of issues, we wonder, can we really be effective? And, and the answer to that is yes, we can. We can, we can be effective. We can have authority. Uh, but the, the way that we do that, one way, and we've talked a lot about uh, praying into the words that are involved, the themes, the prayer themes, that is definitely one way to be effective and to have authority. But the second way is our own life, that the lifestyle that we have, the character that we have, because we part of the effectiveness and the authority is who we are as those who pray. And that's what we want to deal with in this uh, session. And the third aspect of that is that we want to grow. We grow uh, in effectiveness and authority as we pursue Christ and as we deal with uh, the issues that we'll talk about in this session related to uh, our lifestyle and our character and who we are, basically the measure of Christ that flows uh, in us, through us, and out of us uh, determines to a large, large degree how effective and how authoritative we are uh, in our prayers. And so um, in this session, we'll deal uh, with more uh, more uh, uh, than words, the fact that our character and our lifestyle uh, is that. So anyway, let's, let's begin uh, by looking at our foundational scripture and we're, we're, we'll then we're going to focus into how we become these things. But let's look at our foundational scripture, Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And I want to highlight a couple of uh, several themes in this verse that we'll kind of hit on in this session. Um, when the Lamb, Revelation chapter 8, starting with verse 1, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, uh, and seven trumpets were given to them. Uh, another angel came and stood at the, at the altar, 
holding a golden censer. And the censer is what would carry the fire uh, from, the golden, from the bronze altar of sacrifice to the golden uh, altar. Uh, and much incense was given to him. Much, in, much incense was given to the angel. And remember that phrase, much incense. So that he might add it to the prayers of the saints. So what we see here is we see the incense being combined with the prayers of the saints. Uh, uh, and, the, and all of this was taking place on the golden altar, it, which was before the throne. The golden altar uh, in Revelation was before the throne. And remember that in Hebrew, as Hebrew says, that the altar of incense was in the Holy of Holies. In the Old Testament, it was in the holy place, but it was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, another phrase that we will deal with in this session, the smoke of the incense, in other words, the incense that was mixed with the prayers of the saints, uh, and there was fire because the smoke of the incense uh, was created by mixing fire, the fire from the altar of sacrifice, uh, with the incense. That, with, along with the prayers of the saints, went up before God, uh, out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar uh, that created the smoke of the incense and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning uh, on, as uh, an earthquake. Um, so what we want to do in this first section is we want to deal with the fact that we that we are a spiritual house, we are the priesthood that ministers at the golden altar, we are the incense, we are the fire uh, that lights the incense, and that we are the believers that that go before the throne. So let's, in terms of dealing with that, let's deal first with the fact that we are that we are the. Uh, that we are the house or the temple and we are the altar of, of incense. Uh, if you remember, just a, just a little bit of review of the Old Testament practices uh, that took place at the altar of incense. Uh, twice a day, the, the Old Testament priests would, uh, would go and they would minister at the altar of incense. What they would do, that twice a day at the time of the the how, of the hour of prayer, Luke one ten tells us this, that the priest would take fire from the altar of sacrifice. The altar at the altar of sacrifice, animals were being sacrificed, and they were be, as as they were being consumed. There was fire, and there were coals that would take place that would come forth from all of that. So there would be a fire pan that would be filled with the coals from the altar of sacrifice. The priest would go to the, to the brazen laver, which was uh, again in the outer court, and they would cleanse themselves. It was filled with water, and they would cleanse themselves uh, with, uh, with the water, ceremonially washing themselves to sanctify and set apart themselves. They would then go to the holy place, and they would minister at the lampstand, uh, the, the seven candles that, that took place at the lampstand, they would uh, trim the wicks and fill it with oil and do all that was necessary there. They would minister at the table of showbread. Uh, and then they would go to the altar of incense and they would take uh, the incense, which remember from Exodus chapter 30, uh, had been prepared with a pre very precise formula that was to be used only for the purposes of God, not for any kind of personal purposes. They would take that incense. Uh, they would then mix that incense with the fire that they took from the altar of sacrifice. And the combination of the, of the um, incense and the fire would cause a smoke to arise before uh, the throne. Uh, and that smoke would be a sweet fragrance. It would uh, smell of the incense, a sweet aroma that would arise uh, to God. So we've got the prayers taking place by the people outside. Uh, we've got the incense that would be prepared precisely for the people, uh, for God, not for the people. 
and the fire that would ignite the incense. So it's a beautiful picture of what is described in Revelation chapter 8 and of prayer that ascends unto God. It's a picture of worship uh, and uh, prayer. Uh, so now with that, let's talk, we're talking about growing in effectiveness and we're talking about a spiritual altar uh, of incense. As we build an eternal purpose house of prayer, what we're talking about is a spiritual uh, altar of incense located in a spiritual, uh, in a spiritual house. First uh, Peter chapter two, verses four and five is, is, is a good guiding scripture verse. Let me read it. And coming to, the, to him, to Christ, as a living stone, which had been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Uh, and so what do we see here? We see that we, the, the body of Christ, is a spiritual house, a, a, an invisible spiritual house made up of living stones. And there's a holy priesthood that ministers in that house, just like the Old Testament priests, they, they ministered at the altar of sacrifice, but they also ministered at the, at the altar of incense, a spiritual priesthood ministering in a uh, spiritual ha house. And so there is a spiritual altar of incense there. Now that spiritual altar of incense is no longer in the outer court, uh, but it's in the Holy of Holies. Uh, and the priesthood that ministers there is not of the Levitical order as in the Old Testament. It's, by the, it's according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter five, verse nine and 10 uh, said, having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey, obey him the ators, the source of eternal salvation being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now we'll read about that uh, in a minute. We'll, we'll look at that order of Melchizedek a little bit in a minute because that's important uh, as well. But the point I want to make right now is that the believer is the priesthood uh, that ministers in a spiritual house at a spiritual altar uh, of incense. Um, the, the altar of incense is us. The, and, you know, I'm trying to make these, all these applications so that we'll see that it's, it's, if we want to grow in effectiveness, we have to become all, all of these things. Uh, the Lord spoke to this to me back in 2019 at our home church related to both our worship ministry that, took, that was taking place at our church as well as our intercessory ministry. And uh, he, what the Lord said to me is very simple. He said, you have to be the altar of incense. You are the altar of incense. You are the place, you individually as individual believers coming together as living stones being the corporate house, the corporate group of believers, you must be the altar of incense. You're the place from which, your heart is the place uh, from which the incense arises up to the throne. When we sing, when we worship, and this is kind of the explanation of it, when we worship, singing songs is not just enough. Singing, singing the right words that exalt Christ is not enough. Uh, you must be the altar of incense. Your heart must be that altar of incense so that incense arises from your heart uh, through the throne. So r singing the right words are not j enough. It must also be your heart that is connected to God where when you sing those words, you mean them. They're, they're, they are in your heart and you mean what you're saying there. That has to connect, the words have to connect with your heart to be that altar of incense as it relates to worship. Now, the same thing is true with prayer. We can, say, we can pray all the right words, we can pray all the right words that, that are related to an eternal purpose house of prayer. We can pray, Lord, we ask that you form Christ in your church so that your bride is made ready. 
We want to be a, rep, a, a vessel where, where, where you are, you are uh, we are the vessel and, you, and Christ is formed in fullness in us. All the right words. We can pray that. We can do all the, pray all these things. But if our heart is not really in agreement with that, then we're really not the altar of incense. Our alt the altar of incense will be the place that incense will arise unto God when our words that we pray are connected with who we are, are connected with the idea and the, and the sense that we want these things to happen. We want Christ to be formed in us and in the church. It's a desire there. So the altar uh, uh, of incense, we must become uh, the altar uh, of incense. So we are the tabernacle, we are the temple, we are the spiritual house, and we are also the altar of incense. Now also, I'm, and what I'm doing right now, I'm setting the foundation so that when we talk about how we but how we b become these things so that we can be effective and authoritative in our prayers and grow in these things, we can understand what we're talking about. So we're setting the foundation now. We are the house. We are the altar of incense. Now, we are also the priesthood. We are the priest who minister there. The believer is the priest who ministers at this spiritual altar of incense located in this spiritual house of living made up of living stones but we're not a the priesthood we're not a priest according to the order of Aaron or the order of uh, Leviticus or, or Levitical priesthood we're not that type of priest we are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek remember that Christ is according to Hebrews is the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, and we are priests under his order where Christ is the high priest. Therefore, we are priests according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, there's a real, there's a distinction between the priesthood of Melchizedek and the priesthood of Aaron or the Levitical priesthood. It's very important as we talk about praying with effectiveness and authority. Melchizedek priesthood is a priesthood of priests and kings. It's a priesthood of priests and kings. Whereas the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, the priest could not be a king and the king could not be a priest. And you see examples where the kings in, tried to do that and the priest that there was a, a, a try, attempted to cross over there and that was not accepted by God. But that changed with Christ. He is the high priest of a, of a new order of priesthood that is both a priest and a king uh, unto God. Now we see that, and I want to just look at that. I, it, uh, we see that even going back to the book of Genesis as he talks about Melchizedek. Uh, and you can read that in Genesis chapter 14. Um, here, let me just read verse 18 here. And Melchizedek, he was the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He met with Abraham and he brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of the God most high. So we see that Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which later became Jerusalem. Uh, and he was a priest of El Elyon, El Elyon, the God most high. So Melchizedek was both a king uh, and a, a priest. Now, of course, it says that about us as well. Peter talked about that. Peter said that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He said, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who was called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what does he call us? Peter, what does Peter call the believer? He says you are a royal priesthood, a, a king, in other words, a king, you're royalty, you're of the order of a king as well as a priest. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, 
And six kind of confirms that as well, especially in the New King James Version and the King James. The New King James reads this, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us, made us as believers, kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. And so we are, we are as a priesthood, we are of the order of Melchizedek, which is an order of kings and priests. And therefore, as priests and kings, we are also called to minister uh, in the authority of Christ. So there's a, there's a measure of authority uh, that has been given to us as priests and kings according to this order of Melchizedek. We, we, so we are to have authority. There is an, uh, there's an authority there. We, you know, the way it works, we go into the, into the throne to minister as a priest unto God. We are a kind of a priestly bride. We minister unto God. But then we come out of our encounters with God, our relationship with God, and minister in authority to the people, in authority in our intercession, in authority in our uh, teaching, authority in our ministry. We get a glimpse of this uh, to, in Jesus' uh, message to the church at Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, this is verse 26 talking about uh, the, the believer who overcomes, Jezebel, said, He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. I will give authority over the nations. Now, the primary application of this, I want to make sure we understand this, the primary application of this uh, is in the age to come. In the, in the eternal ages, we're granted a great measure of authority as we overcome in this age. But there's a, there's a measure of authority granted even in the church age to those who uh, to overcome. And so as priests and kings, according to the order of Melchizedek, uh, we, are, we are granted uh, authority, some kingly authority. Uh, now, again, I'm just continuing to set the, the foundation uh, so that we can talk about how do we grow in authority, how do we grow in effectiveness and authority as we grow as these priests there. Um, now, again, continuing to with this, we, you know, we've established the point so far that we are the house we are the altar of incense, and we are the priests who minister uh, as kings and priests at that altar, that spiritual altar of incense. Now, the next point I want to make, and it's in your notes on page four, much incense was given. Revela remember, you remember Revelation chapter eight says to the angel that much incense was given uh, to uh, them. Uh, so for effective prayer... Uh, our lives must become that sweet aroma that ascends to the throne as incense. Remember the, uh, in Revelation 8 in the, the picture of the, of the Old Testament priest, the, uh, the incense, when it was mixed with the fire, there was a sweet aroma, that, a fragrance that arose unto God that was a pleasing pleasing aroma. And we're the incense uh, that must ascend from the, from the altar uh, of incense. Um, if you look, you know, Ezekiel, let's look at that incense here for a minute. Uh, and we'll make the application that we must be the, the, uh, the, the incense that arises unto God. To God, as Exodus chapter thirty verse seventeen. Now Exodus thirty is the is the chapter where it talks about the altar of incense and it talks about the incense itself. Now this is talking about the uh, the incense that burnt that is burnt on the altar of incense in the Old Testament tabernacle. Uh, uh, Exodus thirty uh, seventeen. Uh, no, I'm sorry, let's see, Exodus 37, I I'm, I'm got it wrong. Exodus chapter 30, verse 7 and 8. Aaron shall burn fragrant incense, fragrant incense, 
on the altar of incense. That was my addition. He shall burn it every morning uh, and every uh, every morning when the, he trims the lamps. And of course, it's also the same as before. So he burns fragrant incense, which creates a fragrant aroma at the altar of incense. Now, we, I said that we have to become that altar of incense. There are a couple of scripture verses I want to read to you from the New Testament. Uh, this is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Um, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself for us. Now listen to this. An offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. His surrendered life become, becomes a fragrant uh, aroma uh, un, uh, to God. But, but, and then 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Uh, but this is Paul's writing. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So our life uh, uh, releases a fragrant, and when it's uh, following the Lord, releases a fragrant aroma, fragrant uh, incense uh, before God uh, that is a sweet aroma uh, unto them. Now, I won't turn there, but and I probably won't even cover it in the, in the teaching here, but they're in, it's in the notes at the end about the book of Esther as an illustration here. If you picture uh, the book of Esther and you picture the, the person Esther, remember she was brought into the harem. And of course, you have to take this out of the natural into the spiritual realm. But she was brought into the harem and she was placed through 12 months under the governmental hand of God, six months of, the, of myrrh treatments, myrrh being that uh, that spice that was uh, bitter to the taste but, a, but produced a very fragrant aroma. She was given cosmetics and other things so that when she went in before the king, uh, there, was a, a, there was a beautiful fragrance over her uh, and she pleased the king because of her uh, intimacy with him as well as with the fragrant aroma that came from her surrendered and laid down life. Now, how does that relate to authority? Well, when Haman uh, arose and was going to destroy all, all the Jews, she went in before the king, and she went in before him, and she interceded on behalf of her people to restrain and to see Haman, who's a picture of the Antichrist, his 10 sons, a picture of the Antichrist, and so she went in to, to before the king. Now the king said this, Esther, up to half of my kingdom. You can have up to half of my kingdom. What is your request? In other words, there was an authority there granted to her uh, in partnership with the king, up to half, in partnership with the king. There was an authority granted to her in her intercession on behalf of her people and against Haman, the Antichrist, picture of the Antichrist, as he was trying to destroy her and her people. So there was authority there, but that for her to, to move in that authority, she had to be pleasing to the king in his presence, and she had her life had to be that sweet aroma, that sweet fragrance uh, unto God. Uh, now, I want to really hit on this because this is a really uh, a big part of, uh, of how we become uh, how we become that incense that arises unto God that's pleasing to him so that when we pray the words we pray, God moves, it moves God to hear and to answer. We see the same thing taking place in the book, The Song of Solomon or The Song of Songs. 
Now, there's a, as an allegory, this book is a picture of the individual believer who awakens to the love of the bridegroom king and begins, an, begins a journey. Uh, let me get this here. It begins, she begins a journey of maturing in love, of drawing closer and in, intim, in intimacy uh, with her bridegroom king. And when you get to chapter 4, it's interesting what happens here in chapter 4. Prior to that, the bridegroom king was trying to get her to go to the mountain of myrrh, which is a picture of the cross, to go to the cross so that uh, her, she would die to herself and die to her, uh, to her flesh so that there, her spirit would, uh, and character would arise as a beautiful incense unto him. And, but she had, up until before chapter 4, she had refused to do this. It was too hard for her to do it. She wanted to, but and, and there were several issues here, but in chapter 4, verse 6, she makes the decision to go to the cross. She says, until the cool of the day when the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. In other words, she will go to the cross. Now, right after that, he says, you are altogether beautiful, my darling, there's no blemish in you. And just in a few verses later, he calls her for the first time his bride. You ravish my heart, my sister, my bride for the first time. But you know, we're talking about fragrance here. And so the very next or even the same verse, verse 10, that he calls her the bride, he, he says, he goes on to say, how much better is your love than wine or the pleasures of of the world, how much better is your love than the pleasures of the world, and how much better is the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices? So, what is he saying? He's saying your fragrance is so pleasing and so wonderful. But how did it happen? Because she said, "I'll go to the mountain of myrrh. I'll go to the hill of frankincense." And so, what is our point here? Our point is that the incense that arises unto God is our life, but it's our life surrendered to Christ. It's our life set apart uh, for, uh, for him. And so much incense means that if we want to have uh, a, an effective eternal purpose prayer ministry that are, that so that our words have impact, and are effective and authoritative, there's a surrender of our lives that is necessary. And I want to deal with four things here. I'm kind of moving now from laying the foundation to talking about ways in which we as a believer can grow in effectiveness and authority in our prayers as we pray uh, God's eternal purpose prayers. Because remember, up until now, up until this session, uh, we have dealt mostly with the words. We pr talked about prayer themes and being led of the Spirit and how to pray uh, the words that safely and effectively in terms of spiritual warfare and all of those kinds of things. And now this, with this session, we shift into terms of praying, uh, in terms of our character, uh, the, the lifestyle, the character of the believer who prays. And so I'm going to deal with, uh, for the rest of this session, I want to deal with different aspects of our lifestyle, our character, uh, that will help us to grow in effectiveness and authority. So first one, we're on page five in the notes. First one is we must completely surrender unto the Lordship of Christ. If we want to have effectiveness in our prayers, we, we, we as believers who are praying must be, live a surrendered life uh, unto Christ. Uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, going back again to the Old Testament priest, if you go back to Leviticus uh, chapter 8, I think starting with verse 22 through about 36, it talks about the ordination of priests, the beginning of the setting apart a person for the priesthood. 
And it says there that what they did, they sacrificed an animal and they took the blood of the sacrifice and they put it on the right ear of the priest, uh, the right thumb and the right big toe of the priest. Uh, and that was, uh, and, and they did this for, I think it was for seven days they, they did this. There was a setting apart of the priest for the priesthood. Now, the, the, symbolically, I believe that the, right, the blood on the right ear signifies that the priest had to be able to hear the voice of God, had to be able to hear God through the word and had to be able to hear him through his voice, spirit to spirit uh, uh, communication. The right thumb meant that the, that the priest had to be set apart unto the Lord for his, for his ministry, the works of his hands, his service, and his ministry. Uh, and, the, uh, and the big toe symbolized his overall walk. In other words, the priest had to be totally and completely uh, set, apart, uh, set apart for God uh, in order to be that priest. Uh, and so if we want to be effective as a intercessor and a prayer, prayer warrior before the, at an eternal, at an eternal purpose house of prayer, our life needs to be set apart uh, for God. Uh, Paul alluded to some similar things when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 through 22 or 21, I think it is. He said, he wrote this, Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And so what is he saying here? Now let's, let's, take, let's just uh, use it as a, as a picture of the temple, that, house, that type of house. Uh, the, the vessel... Uh, has to be a vessel of honor to be useful to the master, uh, cleansing himself from all, and he goes on to talk about the lust of the flesh and different things. Uh, he will be a vessel for honor. He has to be sanctified. Now, what is sanctified? Set apart for God, set apart for God, uh, and he'll be useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And so uh, if this is the first step in becoming really an effective and an authoritative person who prays in the, in the eternal purpose house of prayer, and that is to be set apart for the, uh, surrender to the Lordship of Christ or set apart uh, through a willing heart for the purposes of God. Now, second, as, new to, as a New Testament priest, uh, we are to be on a journey toward uh, close union with Christ, close union uh, with Christ. Now, there's a scripture verse that in Ephesians that at first doesn't sound like it applies to, to being in union with Christ, but it absolutely does. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, and we'll go through about 32, I think. Um, Paul wrote this to the Ephesian church. He said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they'll become, they go in, come in union. The husband and wife come to union in body, soul, and spirit. And the mystery is great. He said, goes on, he says, the mystery is great, uh, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And so what is he saying? He's saying in terms of Christ and the church, the goal is to draw them uh, together, uh, together in, in, in union uh, with each other. The, and so if we're going to be effective in a, at the eternal purpose house of prayer, we have to be in growing union with Christ. Because where's the, where's the altar of incense now? The altar of incense is not in the holy place, it's in the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and, and so nobody else could go into the Holy of Holies. We have to go into that Holy of Holies relationship in Christ, in oneness, in union with Christ. Now, of course, 
We don't have to be perfect to do that. If we had to do that, none of us would ever uh, be uh, able to go and pray and offer prayers at the altar of incense. But uh, we, we can do that because of imputed righteousness where in Christ we are made righteous. But there's an, an application or a lived out aspect to this that we have to grow more and more in union uh, with this man, Christ Jesus, to be effective and to have authority there. Now, we can see that a little bit in the, uh, the, the Zadok priesthood uh, that is described in Ezekiel chapter uh, 44 and in other places. If there's a picture of the, of the temple in the millennial age and the age to come that takes place there, and it talks about two types of priests that, it, that will be ministering in the age to come. There's the one set of priests who went far away from God uh, during the times when he needed them. Uh, and because they went far away from him, they are able to minister, but they can only minister in the outer court. They cannot come into the, uh, into the inner court. But there's the sons of Zadok. Uh, now we get Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the Hebrew word. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Uh, but it's a king of righteousness. Uh, and Zadok, Z which Zadok comes from that latter, latter part of that word, uh, means righteousness. And so that group, the sons of Zadok, it says about them, let me see if I can find it in my notes here. It's in uh, Ezekiel 44, uh, 15, 15 and 16. And I would recommend you read all of Ezekiel 44. But it says this, But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the sons of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood. They shall enter the sanctuary. They shall come near to my table to minister to me and to keep my charge. In other words, they were faithful. They, they uh, surrendered to the Lord. They were, they, they were obedient to God. And so they were able to minister in a union with God. And so out of, out of, that, out of that lifestyle, of union, we can, we can minister un, uh, to uh, Christ. So that's the second uh, point. Um, the third one on page seven in your notes, the idea of a priesthood growing in union with Christ leads to the expectation of the believer being progressively conformed into the image uh, of Christ, being progressively conformed into the image of Christ. Um, you know, this is an ongoing lifetime issue of being progressively transformed uh, from glory to glory, faith to faith, uh, into the image of Christ. And so we don't have to be perfect by any means. If we had to do that, then we would n none of us would ever, uh, would ever pray at a, an eternal purpose house of prayer. Uh, but there's a journey that we're on there uh, to do that to be that way. In Ezekiel 44, 17, again, we're talking about the sons of Zadok and the, pre, the two diapers of priesthood. It says this, it shall be that when they enter at the gates of the inner court, the Holy of Holies, uh, they shall be clothed with linen garments and wool shall not be on them while they are ministering in the gates of the inner court and in the, and in the house. And so the, lin, the, the wool is a picture of works of the flesh, and linen is a picture of the works of the Spirit, of being led by the Spirit. And so the priests had to wear linen garments when they went in before the Lord. They, in other words, no flesh could go in there. So again, a picture of the need to be transformed uh, in, uh, in the, by the work of the cross to be conformed into the image of God so that the goal is for us individually to merely be an earthen vessel for the person of Christ to live his life in us and through us 
uh, externally. And the more that that happens, which is a lifetime journey, the more that that happens, the more effective the, the principle is that the, the in, there will be increase in effectiveness and authority. Now, I don't want you to think that I've got to go to the end of my life to have any kind of a positive effect or authority, but it, grow, it does grow. There is an increasing authority as Christ lives in us because the authority is not in us. It's the authority is Christ. The authority is, uh, is Christ in us and through us. And so the more he manifests through us, the more impact and authority. So there's a journey there uh, for that. Um, so the fourth one, the fourth way we grow, so we've talked about being set apart for God, being in union with God, being conformed to his image. Now the fourth one is now that we have established the need for priests to be progressively conformed into the image of Christ, the next call is for an intimate relationship with Christ. And so intimacy with him, part of that obviously is the being conformed there to the image of Christ, but part of it is just developing that relationship with the Lord, an ongoing relationship uh, with him that where we abide in him, in him, we abide in his word, we pray and we have that ongoing ministry unto the Lord. So that's a, the fourth one. So we've talked about the priest being that fragrant aroma and it's the, the life of surrender that makes that. Now, remember, I want to talk next about mixing all of this with fire, mixing the incense with fire. Remember that the priest would come into the Holy of Holy, uh, or into the holy place, and they would mix, they would take fire from the altar of sacrifice and they would mix it with the incense and it would ignite the incense and that would create the smoke that would arise uh, as a sweet fragrance unto the Lord. And the prayers would be going on at the same time this was to take place. Now, so we want to talk about the fire, uh, mixing with the fire. Now, we have to bring the fire. Not only are we the temple, not only are we the altar of sacrifice, not only are we the priesthood, not only are we the incense, we're also the fire that ignites with the incense to, to rise up, to create the prayers uh, that make effect and impact there. For the sweet aroma, this page eight in your notes, for the sweet aroma of the incense to arise to heaven, the incense was mixed with fire taken from the altar of sacrifice. And there's two, uh, I think two aspects, uh, three aspects, uh, or four aspects, I guess it is, of, of that fire uh, that comes uh, there. First, effective prayer comes from a believer whose heart burns fire, burns with desire for Christ to have a prepared bride. It's so important. You know, we can pray all the right words. Oh, Lord, please help your church to become the bride of Christ. But there's no passion there. There's no real fire there. There's no real desire there for that to happen. Uh, very little impact. We have to burn with a real heart of desire for Christ to have uh, his bride. You know, the Lord spoke this to me not too long ago. said, as a believer, as me, as a believer, my desire is to be prepared as his bride. Be prepared as his bride. But as a forerunner, me as a forerunner, my desire is for Christ to have his bride in fullness as his inheritance. And there's a big difference there. We need both. We need to have a a burning desire for us to be made ready as Christ's bride. We, have, we need to have a burning desire for that, but we also need to have a burning and passion desire for Christ to have the full, full complement of his bridal company made ready for him as his inheritance. As a forerunner, that is it. And so it, it, there, it is really important that we have that burning passion uh, for all of that. That's so needed uh, in this hour. And so anyway, first, of, first part of the fire 
uh, is that we burn with desire for Christ to have a prepared bride. Second, effective prayer comes from the believer who burns with a Holy Spirit inspired burden for the state of the church and the world. Uh, fiery prayer comes when we're really burdened for the state of the church, the condition of the church, and the condition of the world. Um, and we certainly live in a time right now, as I'm teaching this, in a time where the church is in a, a, a really bad state or condition globally. Overall, it's not in a good place. Uh, and the world is certainly not in a good place either. And so hopefully that will create a burden in our life where we see the goal of the scriptures for the bride to be made ready and we see the condition of the church and the world way down here and it should lead us to a huge burden to pray. So we don't just pray ritual like we don't really care. We pray with a real burden for uh, the church to be made ready there. The, out of that will flow the fire uh, that will ignite the incense and produce results. Third, effective prayer comes from a believer who has faith that his or her prayers will help fill the bowls of incense uh, before the heavenly golden altar. Now, th this is important as well. We, gotta, we have to really believe that our prayers uh, are going to have an impact. You know, it's, it's one thing when you pray for your day to be good, uh, to believe for that, that God is able to answer that. It's a, it's a little, maybe a little bit harder, but it's, it's another thing for, to believe when you're in church and somebody has a physical need or whatever for you to pray for healing upon that person, to believe that God is going to touch that person and actually heal them. There's a, there's a, there's a real faith there that just, that just is there, that comes. But it's a different issue when you're talking about, Lord, pray that the global church will be transformed uh, into the image of Christ and become the worthy bride for Jesus. That's a whole different level of faith. But we have to, we have to believe as we, as we pray that as we pray that God is using our prayers to fill those incense bowls with the prayers of the saints and is using our prayers. Otherwise, we're just going to go through the ritual go, or either not do it at all. We'll go through the motions of doing this without any level of belief or faith that God is going to move on our behalf. So it's really important that we have faith there, uh, that when we pray that God is hearing those prayers and he is using them. We may not ever see the results like we would if we were praying for uh, somebody in our church to be healed of a sickness. We may never see the results, but we still have to have the faith that we're, we were accomplishing something powerfully and mightily by, in God's purposes. Now, the fourth one, uh, again, we're to under the idea of fire, is effective prayer comes from a believer who has knowledge of the topics and issues affecting God's eternal purpose. And we, we will, we've hit this in several sessions, and we'll hit it again, I think, in the next session. Knowledge is, is important uh, to, to know what to pray. Well, you know, it's hard to pray with fire for into God's eternal purpose if you don't know what his eternal purpose is, if you don't know the dimensions of it, the aspects of it. So knowledge is important uh, there uh, as well. And so uh, it's important to, to learn what God's eternal purpose is so that you can effectively pray into God's eternal purpose with, uh, with effect and with understanding and knowledge. Uh, so anyway, that concludes the session. Let me just summarize. We can pray effectively God's eternal purpose prayers. We can, we can have authority in our prayers. That we're, we're, God uses our prayers in a very real and significant and powerful way. But we have to, we, we have to grow in those, in, into effectiveness and authority. 
I mean, there's a measure when we begin, because you know, I don't want us to think that we have to be totally mature. We'll never start if we, do, if we think that, because all of us, we see our weaknesses. We see our frailties. We see those areas of our life where we can't do anything. But yet, at the, at, at the same time, we see as we've matured, there's, a, there's an increase in authority in our life. Uh, and so that's what I'm talking about. Start now, start at the beginning, wherever you are. Start wherever you are. But as we implement these various issues into our lives, as God does these things, transforms us more and more and more to where our desire is to see him have his bride and our life is conformed progressively into his image so that it's him living in us. It's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. So when, as those kind of things happen and grow, there's an authority that increases there that becomes the incense, that becomes the fire, that becomes the actually altar of incense, that becomes the, the priest who, who is a priest and a king unto God. So my challenge to all of us in, in, as we conclude this session, my challenge to each and every one of us is let's set our life apart for God. Let's say, yes, Lord, Take me and use me. Uh, I want to be a vessel of honor in your house. I want to be set apart for you, sanctified, useful to the master. I want to, I want to be those things. I want to do that. I want to pray with passion and fire for your bride to be made ready. I want all those things. I want to be that forerunner you want me to be. I know that I am a weak person. I know that I am... Uh, uh, filled with frailty and sin and fleshly issues. I know all those things, but yet my desire is to grow. Conform me into your image. Conform me so that you are in me in fullness and that you flow out of me in fullness so that you, Christ, the, the all authoritative one, can bring change and impact filling the, the incense bowls uh, with, your, with the prayers of the saints that have effect, that have authority, that make impact. Let's do it. Let's, let, let's ask God to do it. Lord, we, we pray. I'll close with prayer. Lord, that is my prayer for me, for everyone in the Forerunner School who will watch this or listen to this. Oh, have your way, Lord. Have your way in this, in the name of Jesus, amen and amen.